I'm happy that you're here. I'm Rebecca Mazoff. Thank you for coming to my second launch event. It is November 7, and we're here to celebrate this new book that was released this week called The Art of Tapestry Weaving. Thank you so much for coming and helping me celebrate a new book. I really appreciate all of you who have purchased the book and um, have sent me beautiful thoughts and pictures. And um, I really appreciate all of you for um, inspiring me to make the book in the first place. Today, I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, the making of the book, sort of what's in the book, the making of the book. And then Emily is here to help um, field questions because she's quite good at sorting those. So right at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little button that says Q&A. And if you have questions while I'm talking or you think of something, just jot it down in the Q&A and Emily will sort all of those out for us um, after I show you a few slides. So I'm going to uh, screen share. So hang on just a second and we will um, play this little thing. Okay, great. Hopefully you can see my slides. And here is the cover of the book if you haven't seen it yet. So many, I'll start by talking a little bit about what's in the book. Many of you are tapestry weavers. So if you've not tried tapestry yet, it's a woven structure where the warps are spaced widely so that the weft, which is the colored yarns that's woven over and under the warps can pack down and cover the warp completely. Tapestry is an image-based medium and the goal for most of us who weave it is to actually make some sort of an image uh, using yarn. We're making the cloth and an image at the same time, which is kind of a fun thing about tapestry. Tapestry does have a long history. It's been woven for thousands of years, uh, tens of thousands of years maybe, to make cloth used for many functions, including wall decoration. The monumental tapestries of medieval times were created by huge teams of weavers, um, mostly in Europe, and they were financially supported by wealthy individuals or rulers or kings or um, whoever had money and wanted to flout it, they would have tapestries woven. This tapestry is part of the apocalypse, which was woven in the 14th century and is now in Angers, France, and I recommend you go see it if you're able to. Um, visit France at any time. I do just want to mention that tapestry is a structure that has been created over, like I said, tens of thousands of years. It was used to make these monumental tapestries in Europe in the Middle Ages, but it was also used all over the world to make small decorations. Um, people in Guatemala use it to make hair bands in, you know, like Cinta bands, uh, which are very narrow but they're woven in tapestry. So we're not talking about a structure that is just from Europe. It is from all over the world and has been used for tens of thousands of years. Today, most tapestry weavers design and weave their own work on a slightly more modest scale than that apocalypse tapestry I showed you. Here are two examples of my own work. On the left is um, Emergent 6, which is only 16 by 49 inches, and Lifelines, which is 24 by 72 and this tapestry behind me is called Emergent 7 and it's about 45 inches square. These are the kind of sizes that many artist weavers are using um, today in tapestry. There are large monumental tapestries still being woven mostly at workshops in Australia and Scotland and France. Um, but for those of us who design and weave our own, we're mostly weaving smaller things. Tapestry can be woven on larger looms like this Harrisville rug loom that I use on the left or on very tiny looms like this Hokit frame loom on the right. The structure of the weaving is the same. So let's look a little bit about what's in the book. Um, this book came out of my work teaching tapestry both in workshops and online. It's uh, over 300 pages and it covers all the basic tapestry techniques. 
It's broken up into two sections. Uh, one is called learning and the other is called making. The first part of the book is all the things you need to know about equipment and materials and set and some basic color techniques. I give you some color theory to help you think about how to choose yarn. Uh, so talk about which yarns to choose. And then the second part of the book is all about tapestry techniques. So the book includes descriptions and practice sections uh, in all the standard tapestry techniques, as well as a chapter about designing for tapestry and finishing techniques. The book starts with an introduction about why you might want to weave tapestry and a bit about how to be a beginning tapestry weaver. I find that so many of us who are trying to learn a new skill as adults get really discouraged. Some of us do, not all of us, but many of us start to feel discouraged because we're so used to getting things right. We've been practicing, you know, our job or whatever it is we do, and we're good at it by the time we're, you know, middle-aged or 40 or whatever. Um, and so it's easy to get a little discouraged when you're trying to learn a new technique. So I talk about that in the book about um, how to let yourself practice and not be perfect at the beginning. One of the things I worked the hardest on in creating this book was making uh, teaching spreads that were easy to understand and follow. There are photos and texts to go with each step in each of the uh, practice sequences, which is really nice for beginners. It's also great for people who just want a refresher about how to weave something. But I worked really hard to make these practice sequences clear as in there's text that describes it and there is also an image that shows you what I'm doing in the text. And that was the part of the book that actually um, took a lot of editing that we went over and over and over to make it as clear as possible. So I hope that that worked out well for all of you. The idea for the book um, came from my teaching. <laughs> Um, I've been teaching tapestry since 2011, and I started out giving workshops um, in the summer while I was still working full-time at my prior career as an occupational therapist. I really enjoy teaching and curriculum development, which I already knew before I uh, started teaching tapestry, but um, boy, this was sort of like coming home to me to be able to teach something I love doing uh, full-time. In 2014, I decided to move um, some of my teaching online, partly because I was still working and I couldn't, a lot of teachers are able to just travel and teach whenever in conferences and I wasn't able to do that. So I wanted to um, have courses online so I could teach them while I was still working at another job. But it turns out that after my online classes um, landed in 2014, I never actually went back to doing OT. So I've been teaching full-time ever since, for which I'm very grateful. <laughs> Um, I've now had a few thousand people work through my online classes and through all of that online teaching, I realized that there isn't a basic tapestry techniques book out there that's both updated and modern. There are some great older books, um, Nancy Harvey and Carol Russell are fantastic examples of those, but the teaching style is a little different than I think we're used to these days. Um, being that we work on screen so much and we're used to smaller bits of information. So I wanted to pull all of this new learning style together into a book that was really useful. There are lots of other shorter books and pamphlets that have been published since. I don't wanna indicate that there aren't other people who are doing amazing things in print in terms of tapestry weaving, but there was not a 300 some page book out there that could be a good reference. I also wanted to keep tapestry alive as a viable art form. That's really important to me. And I feel like books are a big part of making sure that the information lasts and is passed on. So I had this idea. I was pushed by a few friends um, to put it out there and given some contacts at Story Publishing. And I was really happy that they picked me up. They were a perfect publisher for me. And pretty soon I had a contract and a couple different editors. This is the first big book I have ever written. Um, and I learned a lot. I was pretty overwhelmed at the beginning by the amount of content I was proposing to include in the book. And after several months of really struggling with how do I organize all of this, uh, someone suggested sticky notes. So I put up a couple big bulletin boards in my office and I put 
the concepts I wanted to teach on sticky notes and then I moved them around until I came up with an order that seemed to work in print. A lot of this was following my online courses, but there were some areas where it just seemed to make more sense for a print book um, in a different order than I teach in my online classes. So eventually all these groupings became chapters and the sticky notes often actually did follow the outlines from my online classes. Um, but I was able to add a few sections that I, I don't have in the online classes. So that was kind of fun. At some point I realized that the book um, was a really big project that seems obvious now, but um, I wanted it to be a great reference and something that tapestry weavers could consult for their whole career. That meant that as I was writing, I quickly filled my 300 page 60,000 word limit that the publisher had given me. When I started the project, I really felt like, oh, um, I'm just gonna turn my online classes into a book, right? That won't be hard. I'll just take my handouts and tweak them and you know, have someone else redraw the diagram so that they're pretty and then we'll have a book. Um, that is not actually uh, what happened. It was um, a much bigger project than I anticipated, which is just speaks to my eternal optimism, which makes me miss reality some days. <laughs> Um, I um, really realized how much when I'm teaching on video, I can just show people what, how to do it instead of relying on words and still images. I can just go over something a few times with movement and that's an easy way to teach. But when you're confined to words and still pictures, it's a little bit harder. So I went out, this picture is because I went to Staples at some point and bought an easy button and um, used it quite a lot as I was writing the book, but every time I finished something, I would hit the easy button. So finally, though, I was done in June of 2019, and I came in at 86,703 words, which was significantly over the 60,000 word count I had been given. But fortunately, um, I think Story's probably used to having new authors turn in stuff that's a little different from the contract. So. They were fantastic and most of the stuff that I had included in the manuscript actually is in the final book. One thing that um, I knew that I would have to do after I wrote the book was weave the samples. So this was last summer. I was using my Harrisville rug loom, which fortunately was empty at the time. And I was able to use it to weave these samples because it's faster to use a loom where I'm treadling with my feet. Um, so mostly they were woven on this great big counter marsh loom that I have. Then there was also the thing where I had to weave mistakes. So there's a section in the book that talks about problems that many or most people have when they're learning tapestry weaving. And I um, wove some of these things and I wove them ahead of time and shipped the whole loom to story for the photo shoot. So then in September of 2019, I actually flew out there. The stories in North Adams, Massachusetts, which is where um, Mass Mocha is, which is a very cool modern art museum. And it was really fun to be there for a couple of weeks. So I flew out, I went to Vermont where I teach every summer except this summer and um, had a wonderful color class with this great group of people. And this was actually one of the last classes I taught before COVID hit. So I really miss doing this, but after that, I drove down to North Adams, which is quite, quite close to Vermont. And this is this photo lab at Story Publishing. From day one, I, I really loved this team that I got to work with. I called them the three M's because I had Michael, who's my editor, Mars was my photographer, and Michaela was the creative director. They were so even keeled and professional. And of course, I'm a new author, so I was I was nervous when I first got there, that's, that's for sure, but they were amazing. I learned a lot about book photography. While I was there, Matt, Mars was such an amazing photographer and I just was con continually impressed by the clarity of the images that he could get and how he could shift the lights a little bit and it would change the feeling of a photograph. And I know that's the definition of a good photographer, but it was really fun to see we did, um, there were more than 500 photos in this book and it sometimes took 10 to 20 tries to get a photo right. Cause you know, there'd be fuzz 
on the thing or the angle was weird or I couldn't get my hands in the picture and my body out of the way in a way that looked convincing. So it did, it took a long time. And eventually though, we finished. This is the photography setup. So we would shoot a picture and it would go to a networked computer and we could see right away um, what the image looked like and evaluate whether it was one that we wanted to use and then keep shooting. And then on the right in this slide is Michaela. She's adjusting the colors for the next photo. So she laid out how she wanted the whole book to look before the photo shoot, including choosing colors and, and even some of how the layout would be, including fonts and all of that stuff. And so she was really directing, you know, okay, we're doing this section and we need these colors or that kind of thing, which wasn't something that had occurred to me. I didn't think that would be part of this project, but it really made the book beautiful. So yeah, there were over 500 either images or illustrations in this book. And this was the spreadsheet we were using. And every time we finished a photo, I would um, click, I, I would color it pink to indicate we were done with it. By the end of the photo shoot, most of these lines were colored pink. And I think this, this document was like 25 pages or something, double-sized sheets. It was a lot. Um, so the photo shoot was, it was amazing to, to do it, but it was two weeks long. And I um, would have to weave every night. So we would shoot photos for like eight hours. And then sometimes I would meet with my editor. So it could be eight to 10 hours. And then after that, I would go back to the hotel and try to weave whatever we were gonna shoot the next day. And I seldom was able to catch up, but um, here I am on the last, one of the last nights I was there, I was weaving this piece on the copper pipe loom on the right and watching The Hobbit because it was the loudest movie I could think of that would keep me awake while I was weaving this little piece. This piece actually ended up on the cover, which I had no idea that that would happen um, when I was weaving it. It definitely has some issues, but I thought, you know, in the long run, that was not a bad thing to have on the cover because um, as we're learning, we all have things that we would like to improve. So, oh, we did go to Harrisville Designs. Um, some of you know that I have taught there and I use a lot of their yarns and they are just a couple hours from um, North Adams, Massachusetts. So we drove out there, the whole team, what, uh, the first Friday of the photo shoot and we took some photos, including this author photo. Um, here's Mars getting a couple shots. I think both of these photos he was taking as I took these snapshots actually ended up in the book. And then Nick Colony gave us um, a tour of the mill one day uh, when we were there. Some of those photos are also in the book. The mill wasn't running that day, which was nice because it was, it's very loud if you've ever been in a wool mill. So we were able to ask Nick a bunch of questions. Um, without the noise of the machinery. I can't remember why it wasn't running, but um, anyway, it was that was a fun trip. So then the next week back at Story, um, here we are shooting some of the rest of the photos for the book. I used a lot of different looms. On the left, I, we're shooting a picture on a um, handy, sh handy woman shop loom. And um, I also had some other peg looms and copper pipe looms and as well as Mirex looms. But um, I really wanted to have a variety of looms in the book just because there are so many options in terms of what piece of equipment can hold warps tightly so you can weave against it. I would have loved to have more images with floor looms, uh, but this had to happen in the story photo lab and we did not have a floor loom available to us to take photos. So um, there are some photos of other weavers working on floor looms in the book and you can use a floor loom and there are various varieties of floor looms that I'm talking about, but you can use them for tapestry weaving. The last day of the photo shoot, um, such a relief to be done with it. I was so tired. We were all tired. It was, um, it was a long haul there. We ended up doing some of the last shots for the uh, book on that last day. And then here's the team. This is myself, Michael Mars, and Michaela. 
in one of the last weavings on the left, you can see the um, weaving on the bench that I was actually sitting on in some of the photos, but um, that was the first tapestry I ever wove. So it's it was kind of fun to have it included in the book. I kind of pushed for that. It didn't really fit the color scheme of the book as much as I think Michaela would have liked, but I pushed a little bit to have it included. So you'll see there's a full page photo in the book with that. Uh, my first weaving in it, which is very wonky, which is why I wanted it included. Here's the front and the back of the book. I just wanted to say a couple other things about what was included. It was really important to me to have tapestry examples. So I wanted to have pictures of finished tapestries from tapestry artists all over the world as a way of inspiring people and showing them, you know, what's possible, but also as a way of illustrating particular points I was making in the book. So the picture on the left has an image of a Helena Herrnmark piece. And then um, there's just the corner of a Mo Molly Elkind design, which next to it is actually the tapestry that was woven from that. And that part of the book I was talking about collage a little bit. And then the other picture has images by Susan Martin Maffei and Julia Mitchell. There are many, many more images of professional or, or you know, completed tapestries, I guess I should say, in the book. I thought the book was finished when I was done with the photo shoot, but again, I was wrong. Um, I didn't have also a clue about how intense the editing would be. And partway through, of course, COVID interfered with stories normal order of operations, um, but we made it through. The illustrations were done by a professional illustrator. Some of the mock-ups I sent her were somewhat questionable as you see here. The one on the left is pretty good, the one on the right. Um, I sent her that and she came up with a really great drawing from it. So she was uh, really good at her job and I appreciate the illustrations in the book. They are clear and well done. Also was glad that I wasn't the one drawing the illustrations in the book. I did end up at the Lillian Smith Center at an artist residency while I was in this editing process. And I had wanted to spend my two weeks there doing um, more weaving than I was able to, but I um, was working on editing. And then the image on the right is um, an example of the last, some of the last samples I had to weave. I actually wove at Lillian Smith because I ran out of time at home. This is an example of the same cartoon woven at 12 ends per inch and six inch per, ends per inch, just to show you the difference of, um, I think it's in the chapter where I'm talking about set, S-E-T-T, -T, which is how widely spaced the warps are and how that influences the what you're weaving, your image. So once the book is laid out then, um, and we've finished all the beginning edits, it, it gets laid out by the creative director, which was Michaela. And um, they sent me for, it's called first pages, second pages, third pages. First pages, they sent me this beautiful printed copy on book paper of what it was gonna look like. So I could flip through and see every spread and look for, um, things that needed to be changed. And we were still changing a lot, clarifying um, text around steps that we were weaving, making sure that everything matched and captions and all of that kind of stuff. And then um, that was in February of this year. <laughs> was it this year? It must be this year. Um, time has no meaning anymore, y'all. Um, so anyway, I, mar I made corrections on this paper and sent it back to Michael, who was my editor. And then COVID hit. And so the second and third pages, um, Story wasn't working from their office anymore, and they couldn't send me those beautiful color pages. So I had it printed in black and white, and I was working from a digital copy. And um, that worked fine for the most part. Um, everything turned out just great. The mirror in this picture is because I was watching the Orioles at my bird feeder behind me as I did the editing. These editing steps took every time I did it, it took about a week. So first, second and third pages, each of those editing steps was about a week. So, and then it was done and it was sort of this like, oh, I don't get to see it anymore, it's finished. And then it showed up on my doorstep in September and here we are, now it's in bookstores.
I wanted to end with just a little bit of um, just a few thoughts about why I weave tapestry, why you might want to weave tapestry. You might have other reasons, but this is a little bit about also why I wrote the book. For me, tapestry weaving is about making something with my hands. It's also about expressing a feeling, a thought, or a belief in image form. Yarn is an addicting material, at least for some of us, and its ability to reflect light and its depth of color is something that I just don't think paint can ever imitate. Tapestry is a fairly slow process compared to other kinds of weaving or to a medium like painting. We're creating both the cloth and the image at the same time when we weave tapestry. Um, and that's one of the, the best things about this practice for me. Also, it's slow and I like that it makes me really focus on what I'm doing. Suddenly the thought that, um, you know, election day, oh, maybe we've heard about the election today. Um, all of the things we're worried about fades away and we can all just be concerned with what will happen when we move this next color over one warp or what will add, adding a little piece of bright pink silk to this weft bundle due to the image I'm trying to make. Those, it, it's like my mind becomes this little focused thing and I'm fascinated with every little tiny thing I'm doing instead of worrying about everything going on around me. I think maybe that's the state people call flow, but tapestry I think is a great medium to make that happen. I fell in love with tapestry almost 20 years ago now and I wrote this book to help other people fall in love with it also. This weaving is by Sarah Sweat, who wrote the wonderful foreword to this book. I think for everyone all over the world, the sentiment is important these days. It says, just this moment, I'm all right, you? I'd like to end by reading a few sentences from Sarah's foreword, and then I will take some questions. So if you're thinking of your questions, put them in that Q&A. Sarah says, Handwoven tapestry is a demanding medium by any measure, and to make it approachable at the beginning and compelling after a lifetime is Rebecca's particular skill and a gift to us all. For this medium is both timeless and utterly of our time, one of the few means of expression that cannot be replicated by machine. Our, wor our world needs more tapestries. It needs your tapestries. Just remember, this book is best commenced with a warped loom by your side. And if you don't have one yet, instructions await in chapter four. Sarah C. Sweat. So I have, um, I had forgotten momentarily that this slide was here. If you'd like more details about the book or you wanna see the table of contents more closely, maybe then you can on, Amazon or wherever else you're looking, you can go to my website, tapestryweaving.com. Under navigation, it says books, and you'll find information about this book there. You can get it pretty much anywhere books are sold. Um, Bookshop.org is a great place to look at. I think Blackwell's in the UK. This image is of the first copy of the book that I got, this copy, from Story. They wrapped it and wrote congratulations on it, which was sweet. All right, I'm gonna stop my screen share and let's hear what questions you all have. I believe that um, Emily is here to help guide us through some questions. So thanks, Emily. What have you got for right. me? Thanks for the, for the talk. I've got a few questions coming in, but one of the first ones uh, that I'd like to ask you is about yarn. And you mentioned in the beginning of the book, you talk about the tools and, and everything we need to, to get started. What do you have to say about, about yarn in the book? I, yarn is always a big question for people. I get this question all the time. And um, part, of, part of the answer is that there are, are different yarns all over the world. And so depending on where you live, if you live in India, you might be working with cotton if you can't find wool. Wool is a great yarn for tapestry. 
In the book, I talk about anchor yarns, A-N-C-H-O-R, and I there's an image with, um, these are four the four anchor yarns that I present in the book, along with what makes a good tapestry yarn. So you're looking for something that is firm and not stretchy and doesn't all compact together completely as you're weaving. And then you're probably looking for something with a lot of different colors. So the four yarns I talk about in the book are available in the US. Um, some of them are available elsewhere in the world. They're Harrisville Highland, which is a simple worsted weight yarn. You can use at eight ends per inch. Uh, Weaver's Bazaar, um, let's see, this one is Highland. Weaver's Bazaar you can see is a much shinier yarn. It, uh, you can blend it, it comes in lots of colors. It's from the UK. And then we have, um, let's see, this one is Faro, F-A-R-O, it's a Swedish yarn available also in a lot of places in Europe, but also in the US. And then Freed is a beautiful Norwegian yarn. They're all great starting points. And so that's how I approached it in the book is just choose a yarn you would like to use to start with, get used to it, and then you can branch out from there. If that doesn't end up being your forever yarn, you don't have to marry it. You can um, try something else, but starting with a small set of concepts around how what the yarn is and then learning about it is how I approached it in this book. Thanks, good question. I have a, a few people who are writing in with both congratulations and thanks to you for writing the book. A few people have added that their copies have come in Yay. and they're very, very pleased. Um, that they've arrived. So I'm not sure if you can return to share screen, but yep. this question might need a share screen. If you can go back to the, the small tapestry of the, with the house on the hill that appears on the cover. Um, so this question comes from Debbie and she says that on the tapestry that is featured on the cover, there, there are there's some issues um, or things that you would have improved. And can you, can you point to some of those things and, and sure. are those issues that you cover in the book? Sure, yes. <laughs> yes, they are issues I cover in the book. So um, I, we, weaving when you're tired um, often leads to things like this. It might be actually, it's probably easier to see on the image of the cover, but I had difficulty with the salvages. They're not completely even. Um, I'm trying to remember what else. That was my main complaint, that it was wider at the top than at the bottom. Um, and I actually was not completely fond of the design of this piece. So we're talking about this little um, weaving. Let's see. Maybe go, maybe go to the cover, I think. See it was that where there we go so here you can see that this is narrower and it's very obvious on the cover um because as i was weaving i was pulling this tighter i actually think what happened is that i wove everything can you see my little cursor yes okay not well but i I can okay. sort of see it. Yeah. So this diagonal line um, was where I stopped for whatever photo we were taking, I think. And so then you can see probably the next day I wasn't as tired or um, uptight and that the weaving for that last purple part at the top got wider. So and that's my main complaint about it. But, um, you know, it it ended up being a great example of a tapestry for um, the cover on a pipe loom, which turned out beautifully. So um, this was a, a pipe loom that I soldered. You can see the solder and it's right there on the cover. And I actually like that because that's what a homemade loom will look like if you're not an expert at soldering, like I am not. Okay, hopefully that helped with that. Yeah. Oh, do I address it in the book? Yes. Um, weft tension is what I'm talking about there in terms of things getting narrower and wider as you're weaving. That's a big concept in the book. It's right in that first um, learning section because it's something that people have a lot of difficulty with when they're starting. So I definitely talk about how to manage that. I show some of the quote errors you might see if you're having trouble with weft tension 
and then how to fix those. So that's a super important part of the book in, in my mind is to show you what can go wrong. I'm saying wrong in quotes because it's all subjective, but um, what can go wrong and how to recognize that and fix it. So on the subject of looms, you just featured the copper pipe loom. Um, and then you said it was important to you to feature a number of different types of looms. Um, but another question has, has come in. And um, did you take any large looms with you for your photo shoot? Or did you have an opportunity to work on any large looms while you were in the photo shoot? No. So in the photo shoot, I only had looms that I could mail. So I had a couple Mirax looms, a bunch of small looms like this is a handy woman shop loom. I think there was a tiny Mirax I had a picture of, and I'm sorry, a tiny uh, Hokit loom, which you really can't get those anymore. But um, other people make similar looms. I think I had a, a Shacked easel weaver and a couple other small looms and those are featured throughout the book in various ways. There was not a floor loom. So Jack floor looms are common. I could have gotten a Jack loom brought up to the photo studio, but they did not have any that I think work well for tapestry. And I didn't want to lead people astray by showing a loom that isn't actually a good tapestry loom. So there are images of um, big looms with beams, like Tommy Scanlon's loom is in the book and uh, loom of Ulrika Leander in the book, just to illustrate some larger tap upright tapestry looms, and then um, a few images of horizontal tapestry looms, which is what I weave on that picture I was showing of the Harrisville rug loom with all my samples. Um, but unfortunately, all of the um, all of the other images in the book are on smaller looms. It doesn't actually matter because the practice pieces are just showing the weaving and the weaving is the very same. It doesn't matter what loom it is, the way the interlacement or technique is happening is the same. Some of the headers or the way you warp or whatever might be different, but the actual body of the tapestry is the same no matter what loom you're using. Uh, another on the topic of looms, Jamie has said um, in the Q&A that she's still waiting or he is still waiting for um, delivery for the book. And so um, one question is, are there instructions on how to make a copper pipe loom in your book? Yes. Uh, in the appendix, there is uh, instructions on how to make a, I have to uh, check for sure, a copper pipe loom and also how to do a galvanized pipe loom. So here is, anyway, so this is the page with making a copper pipe loom in the appendix and it will show you what to buy and how to put it together. And um, that's the simplest of, happen to have one sitting right here, the simplest of looms that is just two use of copper with threaded rod in the middle. Um, that is the only, those pipe looms are the only looms I show you how to make, but there are lots of instructions online about how to make looms. So that it's possible that you can make a different kind of loom also. So you, you touched on this briefly before another question about looms, but um, Jamie's also asking is how, wh what are your opinions or thoughts or experiences with rigid, rigid heddle looms for tapestry? My, um, this is funny that you ask that. I have had these questions about rigid heddle looms for a long, long time. And I always say rigid heddle looms just aren't the best for tapestry. And I recently had a talk with Liz Gibson. If you all are rigid heddle weavers, you kn probably know Liz, she runs Yarn Worker School. And she convinced me to try rigid heddle looms for tapestry because she actually teaches some tapestry on her rigid heddle looms. So um, looms that, have the rigid heddle looms that have the beams that the fabric wraps around and then there's a separate beam uh, that holds the warp tend to work better than the kind that just, there are rigid heddle looms that just have, they don't have those extra beams. They just have the rotating beams at the edge. It's really hard to get a good tension on those looms. So um, 
I am currently borrowing a Shacked Cricket from Shacked to test this myself, and I don't have a final answer on that, but I believe that is one of the looms that holds a pretty good tension. Same thing for table looms. The problem is that the beams are so small and the little uh, mechanism, the ratchet mechanisms that hold the tension aren't very strong. If you have a loom like Louette makes a bunch of table looms that are fabulous. If it holds a really tight tension, it's great. You can use it for tapestry. If it doesn't, then it's not the best choice loom. So I am going to hedge on this, Jamie, and say that the um, in terms of rigid how to looms, it depends. It depends on what loom you have. And you know, you can feel free to ask um, in some of my other venues about uh, specific looms, but I will be writing a blog post about rigid huddle looms before too long. I don't talk about rigid huddle looms in this book at all. I'm just talking about looms that are made specifically for tapestry. Moving on from, from yarn and from, from looms, a question is coming in from Molly who says, Rebecca, thank you for such a complete manual of detailed information about every aspect of tapestry weaving. She says, this may sound like a mean question. I don't know about that. This may seem like a mean question, but is there anything that you had to leave out? You said, you know, you had a huge word count, but that your editor was able to mostly fit everything into this book. Um, so did you have to leave anything out? And would those cutting room floor pieces end up in a different or another book someday? That's a great question. There are always, I think, probably in any book project, things that get cut out. Um, I did end up leaving some things on the cutting room floor. I ended up focusing a lot on what does a beginning tapestry weaver need to know? A comprehensive list of basic tapestry techniques. And so you'll figure out how to make all kinds of forms and outlines and pick and pick and all of those things we would expect to find in a basic techniques book. One of the places I ran into questions was in terms of hachure, which is a form of hatching, but it's a very particular form of hatching that is used in France. And I do teach it in some of my online classes. And I had originally intended to include it in the book. And I had some long conversations with Elizabeth Buckley, Susan Martin Maffei, and Chrissy Freeth, who are all French trained tapestry weavers who know a lot about Heshore. And they convinced me that uh, there's a lot about it that um, it, it's just not a beginning tapestry technique. So I did leave that technique out. There is part of a page that describes what it is and shows you what it looks like and how it's used. But I don't have um, a lot of explanation about how to weave Heshore. That could be something for another online course or another book. And then there's uh, obviously things I would have loved to include, like how to do transparency and tapestry. And um, that's one where I talk about weft bundling and a little bit about color and how to create some transparency effects. But boy, you could write, you could probably write a hundred page book about transparency and tapestry. So that will be for another book or another project. Um, a few other things like that. The, the color theory is fairly basic. It's useful, but you know it would be wonderful to be able to go more in depth with that and um, a few other higher level techniques. So yeah, there were things that are not included, but I only had 300 pages. So um, perhaps another book someday, not right now, <laughs> but once I recover, um, then those would be definitely yeses. Um, and I'll definitely be teaching that stuff and do teach that stuff online. And so that um, that's my practice arena is to teach it online and then, oh, then you can write about it. So thank you, Molly, that is a good question and it's not mean at all. So this is a, a maybe another way to ask that question and get a more focused answer. But Noelle from Australia says she's looking forward to her book landing there. And she's asking very directly, what's, what is in the book about designing for tapestry? Not necessarily techniques or advanced techniques or advanced design that you had to leave out that may end up in another book, but what is in the current book about design? Particular to design, okay, cool. 
So design is, this is another area, of course, where I definitely needed, here's the, I just want to show you the um, chapter. It's probably backwards for you. The chapter header for design was real pretty. Um, this is another area where I could have written a whole book about this. And fortunately for all of us, Tommy Scanlon has written a book about designing for tapestry and it is um, finished and it will be published in May of 2021 from Schiffer Publishing. So um, I know this because I did write the foreword to that book. So I will admit that I have seen it and it's a lovely book. And so that was a relief to me actually. I knew that that was in process before this book came out and I didn't have to be quite so angsty about having to leave the design chapter shorter than I wanted. I think it's about 25 pages. And um, I do talk about things like, what are you trying to express? In terms of design, I think this is the place where we struggle a lot, especially if we don't have an art background in other mediums. Um, what do we really want to say? And then learning how to mix our ideas with what this medium will allow in terms of expression. Um, there are limitations because of materials and the grid that we're working on. So I talk about that. How do you, how do you work with those limitations in terms of your ideas and how do you simplify? And then I give, um, simplification is a big part of it actually, because especially if we're talking about weaving very small things, it's important that you learn to leave things out. Um, and then there's just some suggestions of places to continue looking in terms of ways that different people use for designing, like using collage or computer or um, drawing or cutting up things. I guess that's collage. So I, I talk about those all briefly, but I don't go into a lot of depth because there wasn't room. Just want to give you an idea of avenues, rabbit holes that you could go down. I do talk in the design chapter about ways to orient a cartoon. So that's always a big question. You design something and you're like, well, I'm just gonna weave it the way I designed it. Well, sometimes in tapestry, often in tapestry, it's best if you turn it sideways. So I talk about why you would do that. And I actually have some tapestry examples in there um, from people who weave, are weaving sideways, but this is the sample that I wove for that. So this one was woven this way, just as an idea of, you know, this, the side of the tree is very smooth and the hill is jagged. And this one, the hill is smooth and the tree is jagged. So the way you weave something makes a big difference in the expression, what, what you're trying to show. So okay. that is in a nutshell, what is in the, um, design chapter. Of course, I also talk about cartoons and how to use them and how to attach them to your warp and different ways to use cartoons. I actually talk about both like dotting. I dot my cartoon on the warp, but a lot of people don't do that. They hang it behind. And so there's various ways to do that and why you would use a cartoon in the first place. So Noelle, it's good to hear from you. I'm, I'm glad you're here from Australia. Thank you for your question. Following up on your discussion about cartoons, Sarah has asked, do you ever weave without a cartoon? And, and do you say anything about this in the book? Yes. Um, I never weave large things like this behind me without a cartoon. Tapestry is, um, there are people who do, so don't get me wrong. This, it is possible to weave very large things without a cartoon. In general, for big things, people use cartoons. Part of it's just practical. I need to know how much of each of these colors I need and I dye them myself and that it's about materials and stuff. Um, also hard to, you weave from the bottom to the top. So it's pretty hard if you're weaving along and you decide, oh, I wanted to put, this element down here, well, it's already woven. You can't change that unless you unweave, which is not a lot of fun if it's a big piece. So a cartoon is about planning. For small things, I weave with cartoons without a cartoon a lot. Um, I look at them kind of 
as samples, as playing, as experimenting. And I think there's huge value in that. I think that learning about your materials and color and what things do and really just letting yourself play with all of that without focusing on, I have to make this line perfect or I have to, you know, that is, that's a great way to learn. And so I encourage both things in the book, but I will say that it has a lot to do with size and that if you're weaving something like this size or, or bigger, a cartoon is probably going to be advised. Thanks, okay. Sarah. That's a great question. Um, there are a couple of what I would call logistic or logistical questions coming. In. Sharon um, is saying that she offers congratulations and she says she just got her copy today. Um, uh, Martha from Costa Rica says she got a Kindle version and is enjoying that and it's amazing. So Martha has like skirted the, the shipping issue and just has it through a Kindle. Um, but also Kat is, is pitching a question. She says, she pre-ordered a book through Amazon and has been notified that there's, there's been a delay and she may not get it until between November 30th and December 20th. Do, can you, do you want to address like this little snafu? Yes, definitely. So there has been some sort of Amazon snafu, which I um, have heard you all thank you for letting me know over the last couple of weeks. Um, some of the Amazon dates, you know, it was supposed to drop on November 3 and you really should have gotten it this week if you pre-ordered. And um, those of you who ordered from other sources, I think probably most of you have the book now or you're getting it any day now if you pre-ordered. Um, Amazon has different distributors in the, and I'm talking about the United States. I don't know anything about Amazon in other countries. Um, the, the distribution dates in other countries are later. So most of you in other countries will not have the book yet. It's just not there yet. But in the United States, um, the smaller Amazon distributing centers have sent the book out and many of you have gotten it. There's some big distribution centers who did not pick their books up in time to get them shipped in time. So there are plenty of books in the United States. They picked up enough books. They have enough books. They just have not fulfilled it. So this is an Amazon issue. Story Publishing has complained about it. And um, I've seen people tell me that some of their dates have been moved up, that, that Amazon is pushing them forward. So don't lose hope. Um, I think that those dates that are really far out are probably not correct and you will get it sooner, but you could always try complaining to Amazon if you're not seeing your dates move up. That's the word I got from the publisher. That's really all I know about it, um, but it's definitely an Amazon problem. And I'm really sorry um, that they haven't been more on top of it. I think there've also been you know, shipping issues in the United States and all kinds of craziness happening. So. I know many of you have purchased the Kindle version to tide you over until you get the book. And I really appreciate that. I think the Kindle is super useful just to have the electronic version wherever you are, but um, it definitely looks different than the print version. It doesn't have all the pretty pictures that are formatted well and that kind of thing. It's still super useful. So thank you, Kat. That's what I know. And I hope that that um, shipping date will move up for you. The other option, of course, is to cancel your Amazon order and order it from someplace like bookshop.org. So I've got a couple of comments and, and a couple of questions. This goes back to technique. In the beginning of your talk, you discussed, you know, what's in the, in the book through the table of contents. Uh, David has pointed out that besides paddling through a table of contents, you also have a great index, which is super useful. David says, I've been able to think of a question or technique and was able to find it quickly in the index. So thanks, David, for, for reminding us of that. And then specific two techniques you might want to look up in the index. There are two. The first one is about Hills and Valleys, Nancy asks, are hills and valleys dealt with in the book or 
are those topics that you had to um, just leave in your online classes. Um, and another is about forced salvage. In the book, are there any illustrations or instructions about forced self salvage weaves? Awesome questions, great. Um, Nancy's question about hills and valleys, absolutely, this is in the book. Um, this is an important concept uh, about how to recognize um, whether the weft goes over or under a warp thread actually makes a difference in the shape that you're making. So I definitely talk about hills and valleys. I bring it in in the chapter, I think it's called angling, but it's about making angles, but it applies to um, making all kinds of, of shapes. So that's definitely in the book. The other question about for salvage weaving, that is one of the cutting room floor things. Actually, it was something I never intended to include in this book. It's just, um, it's, it takes too many pages and I didn't have the pages. For salvage is so fun and a great concept. And it's traditionally done by Navajo weavers on a different kind of for salvage um, setup that than I teach in one of my online classes with Sarah Sweat. Um, so um, it's not in the book. If you wanna learn the for salvage fringe list technique, um, there is an online class about it. And that is something that maybe I can convince Sarah to write something about at some point, but at this point it's not, that technique is not in the book. Great questions though, thank you. So we are nearing the hour mark. And so perhaps to help wrap up um, the discussion of the book and, and your life as a tapestry weaver, um, I have a question here from Gail. Um, excuse me, I'm, I, the technology is, <laughs> is bewildering me at the moment. I'm sorry, this is a question from Robin. Uh, Robin says, how did you arrive at the style of tapestry weaving that you do? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I didn't talk about this at all in my, in my little talk, but um, I learned tapestry weaving from, um, I was the apprentice of James Kohler, who was a tapestry weaver in Santa Fe. And he, um, I'm, I'm mentioning that because this was a New Mexico thing. I grew up in New Mexico and I feel like it actually has influenced some of my outlook about teaching tapestry, both in terms of technique and in terms of just a sort of New Mexico sensibility about things. It's a very culturally mixed place. And so, um, James, my teacher, wove from the back, which is still what I do on my large format pieces. A lot of influence from France, but there are things missing, like hachure is a French technique that neither James nor I have ever studied specifically from like a French master. Um, there are people who teach that though, and you can um, take classes from them. Uh, so my style of tapestry developed mostly from this sort of European base. So when you think of tapestry made at the Gobelin, st stuff that came down from medieval tapestry, these large monumental pieces like the apocalypse, um, those kinds of things are sort of in the lineage of the tapestry that I'm teaching. But there's some other things that sort of creep in in terms of I like to use a floor loom and the beater on the loom is a kind of New Mexico Hispanic weaving thing that crept into my weaving and I really like it. Um, so overall the style comes from Europe, but there are nods to other tapestry weaving traditions in the world. There's tons of tapestry in Central and South America. Um, and I'll just say to end that though I weave from the back on my large works like this. I weave from the front on many of my smaller works and the book is presented in a way that allows you to do either one. I present the techniques first from the front. That is how most, thanks to dear Archie Brennan, um, such an influential tapestry teacher weaver for so many decades. Um, he passed away almost exactly a year ago now and 
um, he brought this idea to the United States that we should weave from the front. I, that's probably an over, you know, a generalization, but um, a lot of the tapestry weavers in the US weave from the front. So I present the book as here's how you would do this technique from the front. And anytime that differs from weaving from the back, I present it as, you know, if you're weaving from the back, you would do this. There are some techniques that work best or maybe only from the back. So those are included also. So hopefully that's a little clue about um, my style. An attempt to be inclusive, but it is largely in the lineage of European flat on the wall tapestry. And that is not to say that I don't encourage experimentation. There are so many amazing techniques being used to pull tapestry off the wall, to do three-dimensional work, pulled tapestry, shaped tapestry. These are all amazing things that are happening in this art form and we should definitely embrace them and experiment. So whatever is interesting to you, this book will give you the sort of basic techniques, the foundation, I guess, is my goal, that you get the foundation of how it works, what the structure is, why you would use particular things, and then you will go and figure out what your path is and you will do whatever makes you the happiest in terms of expression. I'd like to, to end with one final comment or a couple of comments. Thanks everyone who has joined. Thank you so much for your, your comments and questions that you've pitched into the Q&A. Um, thanks for the congratulations that you send on to Rebecca. Um, there are there are several questions I wasn't able to to get to this evening, um, and so I apologize for that. And I hope that you're able to um, use the Google machine and and find some of those answers, and even Rebecca's blog, and other weavers and tapestry weavers have blogs that perhaps you could look to for resources. On the line of resources, and because Rebecca, you sort of has, have hinted to this, um, I wanna bring up Kathy's question. Um, Kathy says she's still waiting for her book as some, some are, but she knows it will be a great resource and an accompaniment to the online classes that you're offering as she continues to learn the art of tapestry. So do you think, um, you need both. Is one fine on its own to the other? Would you recommend practicing through the book form first or vice versa? Do you have any thoughts on how your online um, teaching works with the book format? I think that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of different ways I could take an answer to that. My feeling as an instructor is that we all learn differently and there are some people who will benefit the most from the printed book and they probably maybe don't need anything else. I think that's rare in a medium like tapestry, but there are those people out there. I also feel like in terms of teaching multimodal um, learning is really, really helpful. So if you can take an in-person class with a tapestry instructor, it's really helpful to be able to stand there and watch them or have them watch you and, and look at what you're doing and say, hey, you know, maybe if you tried it this way, it would work. Um, so in, I, even though I mostly teach online, I still believe that in-person teaching is really, really helpful. Um, the advantage of online teaching versus just reading it in a book is what I was talking about early in the, in the presentation about um, being able to show you something in a moving version. So I did my very darndest in this book to make the text super clear and the photos really clear. And I think that it's possible to pick up the techniques with just the book. And that's my hope, that's why I wrote it. Um, and there are people who will, will, will not need anything else until they get more advanced. Um, but I think the combination of having the book and being able to see some, at least video, if not in-person teaching is really helpful. Um, so that's my hedge on that. I think the answer is different for different people. I just think that it is 
helpful to at the very least watch some video, watch YouTube videos, watch um, how people are managing their tools and their hands and their yarn um, as they're weaving. And there are quite a few online YouTube videos out there also that will show you um, this kind of tapestry weaving. So hopefully that's, um, I know I didn't, I didn't come down on a hard answer there, Kathy, but I think um, for most of us having both of those things is good. And you may find that this book is the uh, textbook for <laughs> my next uh, retreat um, in-person teaching. So yeah, thank you so much, you all. I really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you all for ordering the book and for, um, being so supportive and cheerful and just excited about it coming and um, and for, you know, coming to my online stuff and reading my blog and all of that. I hope it's helpful. My intention is that all of that is just something to help you learn. I think making things is such a powerful thing. This year 2020 has been really hard with a global pandemic and all kinds of other things happening. I really, really feel like using your hands to make things is um, important and it really can make a difference in the world. So that's my last plea and um, bit of thanks to everyone for coming and participating and for buying the book. For goodness sake, I would not be successful with this book if it weren't for all of you. So there's a long list of acknowledgements in the back of the book, and I'm not going to name all those people now, but a lot of people help me with the book also, and I appreciate them so much. So thanks to you guys. And um, now go weave something, or if it's evening where you are, go put your feet up for a while and um, have a good evening. I will have a recording of this up if you want to review anything or your friend didn't get to see it um, in a few days, right on my website. Thanks, y'all.